From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Jeff Whitworth will discuss current insect activity in that newly emerged winter wheat around Kansas, which he says does not include those army worms, which have caused so much havoc this past summer and early fall. And he advises you alfalfa growers about pea aphid and potato leafhopper control at the final cutting of the growing season. Then, from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCowan, We'll talk about easement agreements between landowners and various industries and agencies and how the proceeds from those easement packs are treated as landowner income for tax purposes. And standing by with another stop, look and listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. That's what's ahead on this Agriculture Today. You are listening to Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in once more. Well, we are later in the fall. Obviously, now we've moved right along in this season. However, we do have some insect considerations in our field crops out there to think about. Wheat and alfalfa, primarily here. Jeff Whitworth is by once again to let us know what's happening. He's a crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. And in our wheat crops that are just now emerging, are there certain threats that are now starting to present themselves insect-wise, Jeff? Well, Eric, as of right now, we're not seeing a lot of pest problems in our wheat. And I've gotten some several questions about, you know, the recent armyworm explosion we had last summer or into the early fall and the fall armyworms. Uh, we have not seen that up to this point in time. So I'm really hoping at least the fall armyworms are probably going south or have gone south to overwinter. That's primarily where they, they overwinter as adults. The armyworms, sometimes they overwinter in Kansas. But I have not gotten any calls, nor have I seen any problems probably in the last month Hmm. relative to either one of those. Now, one of the worms that we do need to keep an eye on is the army cutworm because army cutworms, the moths were around last week and this week and next week laying eggs. So even if they are, you probably are not going to notice the damage, you know, maybe for, depends on the weather, another month or two because the eggs take a while to hatch and then the when their larvae are small, they don't feed that much, but the damage starts showing up in late February, March, April. That's when they can do the damage. So I'm hoping if we have any worms, that's all that's left is the army cutworm. And, you know, the last two years, we've had really pretty serious infestations of army cutworms. Um, I'm hoping this year we won't have too bad a one, but I have not heard anything yet. So. Is there anything in a proactive sense that one can do in anticipation of army cutworm damage? Uh, you know what? Not really. Uh, if you're out looking for worms, for army worms or fall army worms, which I recommend because we have seen army worm damage, uh, at least in south central Kansas and the central part of the state, clear up into November uh, in wheat. If you get out and look and you start pretty closely for window painting on the leaves, that would be an indication she has some small larvae. The larvae, when they're small, they're really tough to identify or tough to see because they hide in the soil or in the leaf litter or whatever around the base of the plants. But get out and look for the uh, little window painting in the leaves. If you have quite a bit of that, you may you know, think you might want to look at it again in March or April. Once the wheat goes into dormancy, it's not going to really cause a problem. It's not going to be a problem. The worms themselves, army cutworms, they really don't go into dormancy, or we call it diapause. They'll really be active any time the temperature's over about 45, 40 degrees feeding. But again, once the wheat's in dormancy, it really doesn't. It's not going to impact it. Once the, that wheat has a pretty good root base down, root system, um, that's what we need it for right now. So, you know, you can get out and look. It gives you an idea if you might have a problem in the spring or if you see a lot of birds out feeding in a wheat field or an alfalfa field, I always go out and stop and check and go out and look and see what they're feeding on because generally they're feeding on one of the worms. And there could still be some army worms oh, for the next month. I'm, I'm just hoping we don't have another problem. Before we leave the subject of wheat insects, is it too early to start thinking about winter grain mites? They're a perennial concern. Yes, we always have winter grain mites. Uh, it is a little bit early. They're a cool-weather insect or actually a cold-weather insect. 
Uh, they do better when it's the temperatures in the 30s and the 40s for daytime temperatures. When it's in the 70s and the 60s, they're pretty much still lying pretty dormant in the soil. But as we get into November, especially if we don't have adequate moisture, that's when winter grain mites can do the most damage because they're really small, but they feed on individual cells. If there's enough of them feeding on the plants that are struggling for moisture anyway, they cause that kind of a silvery look to the plant just because they're collapsing those those cells and sucking the juice and the chlorophyll out. At that point in time, you may want to get out and monitor and see what the situation, see how much of the field is actually involved, and just hope for moisture. Moisture is pretty much a curative agent for winter grain mites. That's hope for that for a, a number of reasons per our winter wheat stands in Kansas. Alfalfa, though, and we do have the last cuttings of the season out on the ground, you say, and, and pea aphids are evident. Yes, alfalfa is the crop I'm still halfway worried about just because of where it is in its development right now. So a lot of fields were just swathed last week. There's quite a few uh, fields that have the windrows still on the ground. There's some that looks to me like they're still going to cut it, and there's some that were recently cut in the wind and the has been picked up. So it's all different stages of development or of um, harvest. And right now, we have a pretty good population of potato leaf hoppers. Those don't bother me too much yet, but we also have a pretty good population of pea aphids coming on. And a lot of the guys are kind of having a tough time telling the difference or distinguishing between the two. It's important that you do. The potato leaf hopper is a little larger than an individual pea aphid. They're both lime green. The potato leaf hoppers very active. They have a kind of a herky jerky motion. They have a little white spot at the head or in the front part of them, and they are winged. And they'll they're pretty shy, so they'll fly or they'll jump or get underneath the leaf or get down in the bottom of the in the leaf litter. They're pretty shy. P aphids don't. They're aphids, so they don't move much. You know, they might all fall off a plant, but they're they're not as active as potato leaf hoppers. The potato leaf hoppers that I've seen in the last week were mostly adults, and that's important because it's the adult stage that leaves, goes away for the winter, at least always has. The nymphs can't fly, so they stay in the field and they continue to feed. The problem with potato leaf hoppers, they can damage alfalfa in two different ways. Number one, they suck the juice out of the plant. So as they're sucking the juice out of the plant, they're also introducing a toxin. As if the fields have been recently swathed or if they're not going to be swathed this year, those are the fields that have more potato leaf hoppers, it seems to me, where there's more foliage. And those are the fields that they can do more damage the longer they stay because what they're doing is they're interfering with photosynthesis. They're interfering with the plant's ability to translocate the nutrients down into the root system for overwintering. So if you're out looking, if you're trying to decide whether you're going to swath your field one more time before winter or not, or if you already have, and you're trying to decide if the potato leafhoppers are bad enough that you need to treat them, keep that in mind. They can interfere with that photosynthesis and that plant's ability to translocate for overwintering purposes. But the potato leafhoppers, as long as I've been doing this, they go south for the winter. They do not overwinter in Kansas. Now, it seems like they're staying around longer and longer. Uh, when I first started doing this 30 years ago, the potato leafhoppers would leave in September. We'd put out plots in, in late August, early September, and they'd all be gone. But in the last two or three years, they're still around in pretty good numbers in late October into November. And I don't know what triggers their their southern migration. I don't know if it's day length, which probably is partially... Uh, a contributor, or if it's temperature or, or both. But looking at the temperatures, I don't think we're going to have any real cold temperatures for the next week or 10 days. So potato leaf hoppers are still around. They're still around in sufficient numbers where they can transmit the toxin that causes uh, the leaves to turn yellow and interfere with photosynthesis. So keep that in mind. Well, what about those P aphids and the threat that they pose then, if any? The P aphids... They're green also, but they're not as active. They don't, they don't have a herky-jerky little motion. They're all clustered usually at, at the terminals of the leaves or at the growing points. 
they're also sucking the juice out of the plant. The problem with pea aphids, they're all mature females. The, the adults are, then they produce female nymphs. They can produce a generation every 10, 12 days. 10 days later, they're producing more adult or more nymphs. And so you can see why these aphid populations can explode quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Generally, we don't worry about them too much this time of year. Usually, they're more of a problem in the spring or if it's a new alfalfa field. If you're planting alfalfa this fall, they can be a concern because there are probably more alf- uh, pea aphids in alfalfa around in this October than in previous Octobers. A lot of times we have some beneficials like lady beetles and some of the little wasps and, and lace wings. A lot of times they help regulate aphid populations, but I have not seen them in alfalfa fields in the last week or two. The treatment threshold, I, I hate to see anybody spray alfalfa this time of year. You know, if, if you cut the alfalfa, it will probably remove the pea aphids. Hopefully they won't have time to, to come back this year uh, in sufficient numbers to, you know, reduce the overwintering survival. The same with potato leaf hoppers. Hopefully, if you're swathing it, just go ahead. Don't worry about spraying it. But then as that alfalfa grows or starts to come back, get out and look. Hopefully, we won't have any potato leaf hoppers, but get out and look for pea aphids. If those pea aphid populations come back, keep monitoring, well, however long it takes before we get some cold weather. And by cold weather, I mean down into the mid-20s. Hopefully, this alfalfa and the wheat will outgrow some of these uh, potential pest situations. At the very least, stay on top of pea aphid and or potato leaf hopper activity in your alfalfa stands here as we finish out this growing season. Jeff, always appreciate the update. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. He's Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. We'll be back on Agriculture Today. We're back now on Agriculture Today, and it's our time once more to visit with Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation out of the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McOwen, here with us. And income tax topics are very much in season here at Year's End, Roger, and we're going to take up an angle on that today, the tax treatment of easement agreements. These are extremely commonplace in the rural countryside and and producers entering into easement agreements with uh, this agency or the other, right? That's right. We see this all the time. Uh, It's very common in agriculture. We can see easement payments coming from utility companies, pipeline companies, energy companies, and the like. And, uh, you know, land uh, is the number one asset for farmers and ranchers. And, of course, anybody in the, that lives in the country that's even not a farmer can be affected by this. You've got a power line that comes through or a pipeline or some type of energy company needs some access to your property. Well, they're going to give you a payment for that. They want to buy an easement. And then that raises the question as to how those payments should be characterized on the tax return. We want to try to sort that out, and that's been the subject of scores of court rulings to define that. But but it could be one of several things. It could be a sale. It could be a, a considered a lease. How are those, as you put it in your article, characterized? Well, it depends. But you're right. The two major characterizations will be either as a sale, which has one type of income tax characterization, and we report that in one way, or it's a lease. Well, the way we determine between whether it's a sale or a lease, is what property rights are retained by the landowner. If the landowner has virtually no property right left after granting the easement, the access right to the company or to whoever is wanting the the access, if that's all they have left is just legal title with nothing else, that's really a sale of the land involved. And so that would be a capital gain. That would be the character of it. And because the, the land is a capital asset, and they might be able to offset that payment by the basis in the land that's affected by the easement. When you get into that issue, Eric, there are uh, a lot of cases, uh, and really the, the touchy part there is, can you as the landowner establish that the easement that constituted a sale impacts your entire property? You know, and we get into issues on that concerning where is the easement located? Is it bisecting your property? Is it running down a fence line? 
Is it obtrusive? Is it a buried pipeline that is not going to affect the surface after it's in and all covered up? Or is it a high wire line that kind of cuts right through your property and affects uh, all the way you use your property? We get into this with dairies, uh, and you have a high power line that comes through, and we've got cases out there that says the straight voltage can affect in essence, the entire property. Well, you get to offset the payment by the basis in the affected land. So that's one analysis right there that's going to have a bearing on how that's reported on the tax return. When we look at this, though, does the IRS have a lot of latitude in making that determination, sale versus lease? Well, it depends on the facts. Yeah. In each situation, it's, this is all fact-dependent. And so the starting point is, of course, what are the rights retained by the landowner? Mm -hmm. And if the landowner is basically retaining a lot of use rights of their property, more than just having legal title held in their name, then basically the grant of an easement is for rent of, it constitutes a rent for land use. And that characterization of the payment then would be a lease payment. And that would be ordinary income. And we're not going to be able to offset that by any basis in the land. So then we have to figure out where on the return that's going to go. Uh, usually that's going to end up on Schedule E, not subject to self-employment tax if it goes on Schedule E. So that's a break there. But that would be your characterization. So ordinary income, if it's a lease, if it's a sale, it's capital gain, perhaps you can offset it by basis in the land. You say that the actual type of easement payment may lend some clarification here. Yeah, you can get payments for all types of different things. You could have a damage payment, and that damage payment could be what we say would be liquidated damages, which would be uh, the company saying, well, if you grant us an easement, we know we're going to tear up some of your property, we're going to compact the soil, we're going to destroy crops for a while, so we're going to pay you X in, up front before there's any damage, and uh, that's in lieu of any claim that you might have later on. You're going to take X up front, you can't get any more out of us after that. That is characterized on the return one way. That's reported one way. And it's different from a damage payment that comes in after the damage occurs and you quantify it as a landowner, such as for damaged crops. If it's for damaged crops, then that's treated on the return as a sale of the crop, and that goes a certain place on the tax return. So all of these have the characterization makes the determination as to where you actually report the payments on the return. So we have to sort through um, not only the character of the payment, but then the type of payment to determine the proper tax reporting of it. Uh, there are temporary easements out there. Are they considered differently then? Well, there's a separate designation for a temporary easement. Those generally, and I'm, I'm, I'm making a general uh, statement here mm -hmm. because it's, every situation is going to be different. Generally, those are rental income. Uh, and we're going to do an allocation to the type of property that's affected to determine the tax classification and how we report those. It could be severance damages. We might be able to use certain involuntary conversion rules with respect to severance damages and negative easements. We tend to see those so where there's an environmental concern that's involved, and so the landowner receives a payment so that their property is not used in a certain way, so that some type of environmental benefit, such as a wetland, is preserved. Well, how do you report that? That's another issue that comes up. If you get a payment because the government takes a portion of your property pursuant to their eminent domain power to put in to, to expand a road or to put in something for public use, such as a park, you might be able to, again, use involuntary conversion rules to defer the recognition of that payment for a while uh, if you find replacement property. So the whole point of this is these payments happen often. We have to characterize them properly. Then it has to be broken down as to the type of payment so that it can be properly reported on the return to avoid any problems with the IRS. And to get to that point, and this is an obvious conclusion, really, but one needs to have a conversation with their tax advisor to sort out where whichever kind of easement payment they're drawing falls in with respect to IRS tax treatment. Yeah, that's right. Seeking good tax counsel always can help produce the best tax result possible when you're dealing with the various types of payments that might be received. Just because the rules are, in some, some instances, they're pretty unique here, but the type of payment will determine the rules, and those rules can vary, and they vary in accordance with the type of payment and the overall character of the transaction. So it's very important to properly characterize these things. And the only way that can be done is for the landowner to provide their tax counsel with 
the information that they have concerning the contract, uh, maybe show them the deed, and then uh, all other types of evidence surrounding that payment so that the practitioner can properly report it on the return. Well, here in our time, we've only given a brief glimpse to the topic. It might be worthwhile as well to go to Roger's blog on his website and take a look at the article he's put together, getting into some of the finer points of this tax issues associated with easements. It was posted the 14th of October, and it's found at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. Roger, before we turn you loose, uh, we've mentioned the issue of basis that is integral in what we're talking about today. But the question of stepped-up basis and how it is addressed in this tax legislation that's currently being considered in the nation's capital, producers are definitely interested in what's happening with that. Can you bring us the latest on that? Well, still, hot topic. Well, it's certainly a hot topic in the Congress right now, and it's a hot topic in ag circles in terms of what the Congress might do to the basis rule that applies at death. Currently, under the current law, the uh, income tax basis of property steps up or down to fair market value at date of death, and so we, all, we commonly view that as stepped-up basis. Mm-hmm. There's a proposal out there. I actually thought it was dead three weeks ago, but apparently it's still talked about by the administration to change that to a, what we would call a modified carryover basis. Some are calling it a repeal of stepped-up basis. But it would do two things, and one is uh, deny full step-up basis of death to fair market value, and then separately have your taxable event occur at the decedent's death rather than when the heir sells the property that they've inherited if they sell it. And so they w- there would be a taxable event. Now, they would exempt that the first million dollars, and then uh, uh, apply the capital gain tax above that amount. But that's a big issue in agriculture, and basis issues affect everybody. Mm -hmm. The estate tax doesn't affect everybody, but basis issues do. So it is uh, of monumental importance to all agricultural producers and all decedents, estates, in fact, to get that stepped-up basis. Plus, from a practitioner standpoint, we need that stepped-up basis from a procedural and administrative standpoint, uh, because it just cleans the record off. We get to start over again, and we don't have to track down what the client's basis numbers are on property that they've held for 40, 50, 60 years. That can be really difficult. Well, time will tell where the chips will eventually fall on this issue. Roger, as always a pleasure. We'll welcome you back in a couple of weeks. Many thanks. Thank you, Eric. Roger McCohen is a professor of agricultural law and taxation from the Washburn University School of Law and with us every other Wednesday here on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. You look out through the big glass sliding doors over the front lawn. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Last Friday morning, I got up early. It was still dark outside. Looking out through the window, I noticed a deep moon shadow. It was a beautiful night. I'd slept away. However... I was up early, quickly getting ready to go to exercise, but not as quickly as I wanted. As the moment I got up, I had the darn vertigo experience once more. It surprised me. Apparently, it's true. Getting old is not for sissies. I canceled my early morning appointment. I did not feel like driving. There was no need but I did not want to go back to bed either. It was six in the morning and still dark outside except for the moon. However, the moon was going down with long shadows. I sat down in the chair I bought many years ago for my father when he was old. It's a chair especially made with dimensions for older people to get in, sit, and get up. It is designed and made in Sweden with leather cushions. It's a very comfortable chair. I had it shipped over from the old country after my dad died. 
Sitting in a chair here, you look out through the big glass sliding doors over the front lawn and across the valley to the far hills. It's a beautiful view. And now, as the leaves are dropping, you once more see the soft outline of the far-off Flint Hills. It's the ridge which holds the other side of the valley beyond the big blue and Kansas River. I decided to watch the daybreak from the old comfortable chair and sat down. Most people are in a hurry early in the morning. I felt privileged to be able to take the forced rest. As I watched the day come on, I saw the light change from dark to a pale dark and purple-gray. I saw the faraway ridge line appear, slowly, ever so slowly, as the earth turned, the vista, familiar as it is, became clearer. The early morning was to be another day, a beautiful day. The rising sun and early morning rays through the cedars lit up the trees. Those trees now have yellow leaves, and below in the valley are deep red maple trees. I quietly sat down, watching the show. It actually doesn't take that long. I've watched it all when I was driving on the road to get from here to there. I remember daybreak when working on the farm in Australia, milking cows or getting ready to go to the fields. But it's not often that I just sat down and watched a sunrise. We tend to watch and photograph the sunsets. I'm glad I was not able to do what I had planned to do that early morning. Apparently, a man can be thankful for vertigo. We should celebrate more daybreaks. Anneke, my wife, remembers when, as a child, her dad took her and the siblings on a very early morning bike ride to a prominent hill to watch the sunrise. It is a long time ago, but she remembers. That was in the Netherlands. If your work takes you outside at daybreak, take a moment to enjoy it. It's special. The farm dog will greet you, stretching, yawning, wagging its tail. Another day. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Our time's away once again. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.